I assume people will keep trickling in, but um, it is three, so we can get started. Um, my name is Jack McDermott, and I'm the project assistant with Long Live the Kings. I work on things from communications to photography, videography, and uh, community outreach. Um, today, I'll be joined by uh, Jim Bauer, King County's uh, fish ecologist, and Michael Schmidt, Long Live the Kings deputy director. And we're gonna be talking a little bit today about the partnership that's uh, going on between Long of the Kings and King County and the captive broodstock program that we're working on up at our Glenwood Springs facility on Orcas Island. And all of this is uh, taking place in order to help restore the Lake Sammamish Kokanee and the population in the lake. Today we have uh, Jim Bauer, King County's fish ecologist joining us. And uh, Jim, do you think you can introduce yourself and maybe talk a little bit about the work that you, King County, do you and King County do to restore uh, salmon? Sure. Uh, thanks, Jack. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Bauer. I'm a fish ecologist with uh, King County. I've been uh, working with King County for about five years now, and I've been working with uh, fish resources throughout the Pacific Northwest for about 25 years now. But uh, at King County, uh, my primary responsibilities are with the uh, Lake Sammamish Kokanee Recovery Project area and um, numerous other salmon recovery efforts in the Lake Washington uh, you know, basin. Uh, also cover quite a bit of um, effectiveness monitoring uh, throughout King County. Great. Thanks for that introduction. And we also have uh, Michael Schmidt joining us from Long of the Kings. Uh, Michael, do you want to share a little bit about yourself and uh, the work that you've done with Long of the Kings? Sure. Hey, I'm Michael Schmidt. I'm the deputy director, as uh, Jack was saying. I've been here for close to 20 years. Uh, over that time period, I've uh, a lot of the work I've done is, is uh, facilitating projects. Um, and now I oversee all of our project work and uh, our finance, um, and uh, that's, that's about me. Sweet. Um, how long have you been with Long of the Kings? Nearly 20 years. Impressive. It's awesome. All right. Well, now I think it's time for us to get into the presentation. So recently, uh, last month, I went up to Long of the Kings Glenwood Springs facility for the second transfer of juvenile kokanee from the Issaquah Hatchery at Lake Sammamish um, to Glenwood Springs. And during this trip, I was became really interested in the work that's being done to restore these fish in Lake Sammamish. So I think in order to start our presentation, it's important to learn about how we got to this point. So Jim, do you think you could talk a little bit about what kokanee are and why this population is in need of recovery? Sure. Well, I'll give some quick background on uh, exactly what kokanee are in case uh, folks aren't familiar um, with, with uh, this, this fish uh, population. So uh, sockeye, which I'm pretty sure everyone uh, is familiar with, and kokanee are really the same animal. They're the same species. Uh, sockeye are the anadromous uh, life history that, that goes out to sea that uh, we're really familiar with. Uh, kokanee are a different life history variant um, of the species that um, they spend their entire life in the freshwater system. So they will, um, they will spawn in streams and then uh, rear and mature in a lake system, um, usually uh, typically a cl relatively closed uh, lake system. And um, you know, this is, this is kind of a unique uh, life history variant uh, to the Pacific salmon uh, species, um, but kokanee can be found uh, throughout the, uh, the North Pacific. In Washington state, uh, we have um, uh, really about four to six different uh, distinct populations. And um, two, two, two of the populations um, um, are really on the border with Canada, um, but there's four different lake populations that are entirely within uh, Washington. And uh, the Lake Sammamish population is uh, one of its uh, the extant run um, that still exists in the Lake 
Lake Washington Basin. And it's particularly um, um, valuable because um, through genetic analysis, there isn't another uh, population that's even remotely close to this particular population uh, genetically. So we've been able to detect, um, you know, really um, hundreds of years of genetic, uh, distinct ge genetic evolution in uh, Lake Sammamish. And it, uh, the population also has uh, high cultural um, significance, uh, especially with the Snoqualmie tribe in this area. And um, there's, just a, there's just a really long, uh, very cool um, oral history um, that can be found uh, with Kokanee and the Snoqualmie tribe. Uh, there, there's uh, some, some great history about how um, uh, Kokanee in the Lake Sammamish Basin and the Lake Washington Basin too, um, would help um, provide food throughout the winter um, when um, you know other 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 staples were were scarce. And um, McKenna Sweet Dorman um, does uh, a lot of outreach for Snoqualmie Tribe. And if anyone ever gets a chance to see um, um, any of her presentations um, on on the history of Kokanee and uh, Lake Sammamish, I'd really encourage you to, to do so. It's just it's just a, it's just a great presentation. Uh, historically, within uh, the Lake um, Washington Basin, um, the there were about three runs. Um, so, Jack, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, that might, uh, so, so there we go. We have Lake Washington on the left and Lake Sammamish uh, on the right. And um, there, there were three runs uh, that, that, um, that we're, we're aware of. Uh, the middle run was in Lake Washington and there's, um, there's some uncertainty on um, the status of that population. Um, but the current distribution uh, in uh, Lake Sammamish um, is really limited now to a uh, what we call the late run or the winter run. Uh, there was another run um, called the um, uh, early run or the summer run that spawned pretty much exclusively in Issaquah Creek. And that run uh, went extinct, um, we believe, in 2003, uh, the last fish were seen uh, with that run. So uh, really, this is the, the last extant run um, in the basin. Um, and the primary streams uh, the Kokanee spawn in today are three uh, smaller streams. Uh, we get about 80% of our spawning in Ebright Creek, Laughing Jacobs Creek, and Lewis Creek. And it's, um, it's just, it's, it's really kind of a neat evolution in this lake um, because uh, these fish have evolved to time their spawning and egg incubation in these very small streams. These streams are so small that the fish would not be able to swim up them in the summer. Uh, there's just not enough flow. So they time their spawning uh, to the onset of uh, the winter rains. Um, and we get the bulk of our spawning in November and December. And then those eggs incubate throughout the winter and juveniles uh, emerge and go out to the lake just on the, the declining limb of the hydrograph in uh, these streams. So it's, uh, it's pretty neat how these fish have keyed in um, to the, the specific uh, properties of this lake. The next slide, I'll show you um, really uh, our long-term monitoring uh, data set for this population. Uh, we have 24 years of good um, monitoring um, uh, information that covers the adult uh, escapement numbers. And so this is trended between, you know, really between 20 fish and 18,000 fish. It's highly variable, um, just like most uh, Pacific salmon populations. Um, it's highly cyclical. So uh, we've been able to see periods where we have uh, increasing population sizes and then declining population sizes. Uh, but uh, the last four years uh, have really been uh, um, uh, pretty dramatic. We've had some pretty profound impacts 
to uh, the system where we've had a really horrible recruitment, uh, starting with the summers of 2014, 15, and 16 that have led to uh, this uh, dramatic decline. And if you were able to plot this uh, information and kind of show a general trend for the population uh, using, um, you know, pr uh, pretty simple metrics such as uh, the running 10 year average, uh, we would see that this population is in decline in terms of abundance. And we also have some issues uh, with genetics. Uh, we're, we're worried about getting into a genetic bottleneck. Uh, because if you just look at the last four years, the number of fish that are returned and then can kind of estimate how many other future spawners uh, that those fish are producing, we're really talking about, you know, maybe, you know, 500, 1,000 potential spawners in the pool over the next few years, natural spawners. So uh, we've been working really hard to... Um, make sure that we get this uh, population recovered and it doesn't blink out. You know, so, what, um, so what's really driving this? Um, what, what are some of the causes of the decline in this watershed? Well, some of the major impacts are um, uh, impacts to spawning and rearing habitat. So the, the first three streams that I just mentioned have all, had, uh, in, have all been impacted in one way or another. There's been a lot of habitat restoration that's also occurred to those. Um, but um, you know, those, those impacts uh, can be uh, kind of long lived in, uh, in terms of population abundance and its effects. Um, other, other impacts include fish passage impairment um, and stream channel modifications. Uh, I'll be showing a slide here in a second of uh, a major fish passage um, improvement project on Zach Hughes Creek, but um, that's just, um, th those are some of the major acute impacts. Uh, there's a lot of work going on for uh, other chan um, channel restoration. Other impacts include um, impacts to stream flow. I just talked about how the, uh, these fish uh, spawn during uh, winter, winter flows. Well, we've seen um, some pretty dramatic increases in peak flow frequency and magnitude in some of these streams. And that can have a pretty profound impact on uh, the scouring of uh, the egg reds um, that kokanee create. Uh, we also have impacts from predation and um, other uh, indirect impacts from uh, other non-native uh, fish in the lake. Uh, I'll be talking about in a few minutes here uh, some some work that we've been doing to evaluate the fish assemblage in the lake. And uh, some of our monitoring indicates that, you know, two thirds of the fish and uh, over half the biomass in the lake um, are from non-native fisheries, um, many of which uh, predate on uh, kokanee and other uh, uh, beneficial, valuable uh, salmonids uh, in the system. Other major impacts include uh, increasing peak summer temperatures uh, and that we get combined with uh, dramatic decreases in dissolved oxygen as the summer goes on. It's a, it's, a, it's a form of lake stratification and it's particularly intense in Lake Sammamish. So that, that's a major problem um, that's likely related to climate change that, uh, that we're seeing right now. And it's manifesting itself uh, with pretty, uh, some pretty big impacts to uh, kokanee, especially those young of year juvenile fish uh, that emigrate in the spring to the lake. Uh, there's also other possible disease issues that we're trying to track too um, uh, that might be emerging and becoming uh, more of a bigger problem. And so uh, the folks that are really working on this effort, um, the main group is called the Lake Sammamish Kokanee Work Group. And the main goal um, of the uh, work group is uh, prevent the extinction and improve the health of native kokanee po population in the lake such that it's viable and self-sustaining and uh, consequently supports fishery opportunities. Um, this is a really high functioning, uh, really ad hoc uh, group um, of 20 plus active uh, partners that include the four municipalities around the lake, uh, King County, uh, the tribes, nonprofit conservation organizations such as Long Live the Kings and Trout Unlimited, 
Uh, we work very closely with the state hatchery program, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and there's numerous private landowners that, um, that uh, help us tremendously along the way. And so timelines for this um, recovery are really, um, we're, we're really focusing on habitat improvements, uh, uh, hatchery supplementation, uh, which we want to be a temporary effort, and really outreach. Um, and some of our main focus areas, though, um, are really on habitat. And so we're, ideally, we're, we're protecting these three main uh, spawning streams. Uh, we're trying to restore access to new areas. Uh, there's, a, there's a big project with George Davis Creek that the city of Sammamish is working on right now that's going to open up a half a mile, three quarters of a mile of great habitat. Um, Washington, Washington Department of Transportation is also working on a major uh, fish um, passage restoration project on I-90 on Lewis Creek. Um, and that's going to benefit kokanee and numerous other species as well. But that's, uh, that's a main focus of our area. We're also working with the municipalities on uh, uh, stormwater improvements and shoreline habitat restoration. Um, so, th so those are main um, those are main focus areas for our conservation efforts right now. But um, uh, hatchery supplementation is another major aspect of this, um, and I'll get into that in a, um, another slide here in just a minute. Uh, here's an example of Zacchaeus Creek, um, and this is this was a major uh, habitat restoration project. We had three consecutive fish passage uh, barriers of, uh, some, some were complete and some were partial barriers. And um, about two years ago, this, this project was wrapped up and Jack has a great overhead slide of this where you can see um, all three uh, fish passage restorations um, at this site. And it also included uh, improving uh, spawning and rearing habitat for about 600 feet upstream of the parkway, which is the main road you see right there. Uh, but also coupled with that is hatchery supplementation. And one tactic of that is um, what we call a remote incubator. Um, and this, this picture uh, on your left is, um, is what we call a remote incubator. Um, it's basically an artificial um, sub, uh, rearing substrate uh, for eggs where we get um, 70 to 85 percent uh, survival, egg to fry survival. Um, it's, it's actually, we're using native, uh, native substrate, but it's, a, it's an artificial setting, but uh, we use that to help bolster this population uh, temporarily. And we couple that with uh, the riparian, um, uh, you know, uh, planting and uh, redevelopment and uh, restoration as you can see on the left. But uh, getting into uh, what we're really talking about with supplementation um, in, involves a hatchery effort. And um, we're, we're doing what's called a, an integrated hatchery approach where we are using a wild fish um, to, to, uh, to um, support our egg production. And what we're doing with those eggs though is, um, is pretty interesting. We've, we've got a lot of different strategies. Uh, we realize that uh, fish that are spawned and reared in natural settings uh, have a very high survival rate. And a lot of that has to do with the size of the fish and their uh, metabolic needs when they get into the lake. And so we're trying to emulate that with some of our processes uh, through unfed fry strategies, such as the remote incubator that you just saw, but also lake releases uh, at night. Uh, we're also trying an extended rearing strategy where we rear the fish, uh, uh, young of year fish through that first summer uh, where we get some pretty intense stratification. Uh, we're also uh, embarking on a major cryobanking uh, effort to um, um, head off any impacts uh, from a declining trend in genetic diversity. Um, and so that, that's something that uh, we're doing. We, we think it might be one of the first uh, efforts in the state. And then, uh, and then of course, captive broodstock is what we're going to be talking about uh, here in just a few minutes. Uh, Michael will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but captive broodstock is really kind of, um, it's a last resort and it's really the ultimate hedge for us 
um, against an irreversible uh, decline in abundance and genetic diversity. And so, um, you know, here, here's a slide of um, some, uh, what we call alabine. They, these, are, these are fish that have hatched and they are absor absorbing their egg yolk for about uh, six to eight weeks and then, then they will emigrate uh, out to the lake. And then that lower picture is um, the Issaquah uh, salmon hatchery. And uh, it's, it's a great facility. Um, if you ever get a chance to see it, it's, um, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're a major partner for us. And that's where um, we really start the captive broodstock uh, process, uh, rearing fish there. And then um, we take those fish up to uh, Glenwood Springs. And that's, um, that's where I think uh, Michael is gonna take it from there and give you a presentation on that. Thanks for that uh, detailed response, Jim. You uh, seems like King County and a lot of partners are doing quite a bit of work to uh, restore kokanee around Lake Sammamish. Um, so we also have Michael here today to talk a little bit about um, the work that Long Live the Kings is doing with King County um, up on Glenwood at Glenwood Springs on Orcas Island. So uh, Michael, could you talk a little bit about this program and sure. the role that Michael or the role that <laughs> Long Live the Kings uh, plays? Yeah, actually, we, we have a hatchery manager named Mike O'Connell up there, so Jack gets pardoned for the slip. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Glenwood Springs is a facility that's located on private property in the uh, on Orcas Island. If you are ever up there and interested in getting a tour, you just let us know. We can get you out there. Um, uh, our founder, uh, Jim Youngren, it started this facility in the late 1970s. Uh, primarily for rearing and releasing Chinook um, and those Chinook support fisheries uh, locally with having a very limited impact to wild fish because there's no wild fish populations in uh, Chinook, no wild Chinook population, sorry, in the, the San Juans. Um, but we do have really good water up there um, and uh, we have some experience at our other facility I'll talk about later called Lilywap Patchery um, doing this type of uh, rearing where we're rearing fish from a very young age to an adult. Um, so we uh, worked with King County to install some uh, of these bigger circular tanks. Uh, there are two of them now at our hatchery and rear kokanee there. And uh, these kokanee we do, we hold them from, uh, we receive them as juveniles and then hold them to adult age. And then uh, the plan is once they do make it uh, to adult age, we will spawn the, the fish. We'll put the males and females together and make some babies. Uh, we'll fertilize the eggs essentially. Um, and then we will return the, the eyed eggs or the, the progeny essentially back to Isqua Creek Hatchery to be hatched and then to go back into the lake. Um, and then we'll just keep this cycle going. And what essentially that does is it, it uh, provides a, what we consider a safety net for the, the population in, in the lake, uh, where you're getting, uh, assuring you're getting about, I think it's about 30,000 or so um, juveniles uh, consistently from this program, whereas it's highly variable what you'll be getting out of the lake. Yeah, Michael, do you think you could talk a little bit about um, when King County first reached out to Long sure. of the Kings in 2019 and yeah, the transfer sure. that happened then? So, so initially, uh, we were looking actually at Lily Wapatry where we're doing steelhead similarly to this and decided instead to move the program or do the program at Glenwood. But there was interest by King County because of our experience doing this type of work. And it began last year with the first transfer from Issaquah Creek. Uh, there were juveniles. Uh, uh, put in coolers, I believe, uh, with oxygen and then put on a plane, as you can see here. And then they were flown up to uh, Oricus Island to make it a quick uh, passage up there and uh, then quickly moved into uh, from the airport, which is pretty close to our facility. It's only a few minutes away. Um, they were driven to, to the uh, tanks and they were put in and they're still there today. So Michael, when uh, King County wanted to do a second transfer this year, do you think you can talk a little bit about the, maybe some of the hiccups or challenges that were gonna be, or that happened this year and how we had to do things a little bit differently? 
Sure. So um, I guess just one thing to point out that Lighthawk is another nonprofit that helped us procure the flight for uh, getting up there last year. So plug to them. Um, so yeah, there were some COVID restrictions this year. You know, every everybody's facing these issues. So it was a little harder to try to do a, a flight. So instead we did truck them up. Um, this isn't unusual that a lot of fish are transferred by truck. Uh, it did take a little bit more time, but uh, it worked just fine. Uh, so we got the fish up. We also had to have that new tank ready to go and make sure all of our first group of fish were all the same size so we could put them in one tank and then put the new fish in the other tank. Um, but everything worked out. So now we have two groups of fish and they're happy. Yeah, and so I think we have a, a short video to show um, about the 2020 transfer this year. And it uh, features Mike O'Connell, which is our hatchery manager up at uh, Glenwood Springs. So momentarily, King County officials and biologists will be showing up with our second cohort of captive brood from Lake Sammamish. The tank behind me has one-year-old kokanee, the cohort group number one that came up last year. And the fish arriving today are juvenile fry, and they will be going into the second tank we have over here. Um, biologists, when they show up, are going to acclimate the fish to the tanks by exchanging some water from our tank into their fish tote. Uh, once the fish are acclimated, they're going to be put in the tank and then they'll be monitored for a, a while until they're uh, happy that they're doing well and we'll wrap up. King County bringing up the kokanee this year um, via truck on the Washington State Ferry. Um, you saw Jim in the video featured a truck or carrying those buckets of kokanee into these new tanks and that's where they'll be raised for the next about uh, two years before they're spawned like Michael had talked about. So um, I know Michael you had originally mentioned that King County had potentially wanted to raise these mm -hmm. kokanee at a uh, lily wop. Um, do you think you could talk a little bit about the other broodstock programs that Long of the Kings is participating in? Yeah sure and um, I think the person asking about the the kokanee life cycle um on as far as the q a um and um maybe maybe after i do this jim can quick answer that question um but steelhead are are uh you think of another salmon that has a landlocked partner that's that's it so steelhead has rainbow trout which is the, the landlocked version of steelhead but we focus on steelhead out at, at lily Rock creek hatchery pictured here um this is a facility that we've used over time uh, to basically take populations back from the brink of extinction. They're down to you know, less than 100 and uh, use uh, very conservative hatchery rearing techniques to bring these populations back. And uh, we, did, we started with um, summer chum and those populations are doing much better now. They're having some low years due to poor ocean conditions, um, but uh, on, on the level, Hook and Al summer chum are doing way better. Uh, steelhead um, are still facing some challenges, but we've used uh, a, a similar approach to what we're doing with kokanee, where we're rearing a portion of the fish to adults. Uh, the differences here are that we're actually uh, taking eggs from the streams versus um, uh, spawning adults, and that allows for the uh, fish to pick their mates and allows for proper, you know, natural selection essentially to occur. And then we take eggs and rear them from there. And then we return the fish as adults to the rivers so that they spawn in the wild uh, versus again us spawning them and doing and taking the progeny and putting them out. So it's slightly different but the, the, the idea of rearing these fish from a very small size all the way our egg even all the way to adult um, is there and that's what we, we have uh, expertise in doing. So there was some original interest in looking at Lilywap um, but uh, uh, we just you know, we transferred our expertise and uh, and have great water at both facilities, which is a really important thing. And uh, we're also to rear fish at very low densities, uh, which is also important when you're doing things like this. So it worked out great. Perfect. And um, so I know there's kind of been, we've been talking about two different sides of uh, restoring the kokanee and Lake Sammamish. There's the hatchery supplementation, which is what we've been doing with the captive broodstock program. And I know Jim touched a little bit on uh, the habitat restoration work that King County has been working on. Um, Michael, do you think you could talk a little bit about the habitat restoration work and projects that Long of the Kings is working on in like urban areas? Sure, and, and the, the comment about 
the question about Rainbow Trout or landlocked steelhead. Rainbow Trout are actually uh, steelhead that make the choice to not go to saltwater. So uh, some of them are landlocked, some of them aren't. Um, some of them just decide that they don't want to go. Uh, you can have some populations that are a mix of trout and steelhead. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then as far as the other things we're doing in the um, Seattle urban corridor, uh, as far as uh, restoration work goes, um, we've uh, focused, uh, been recently focused on the Ship Canal in Lake Washington, um, and in part because that's a, an area of high mortality for basically all of the salmon and salmonid populations that go through. Uh, this is due to it having high water temperatures and low dissolved oxygen um, and high predation rates from both um, seals and sea lions and then also um, uh, invasive fish populations or warm water fish populations in the, in the um, canal. So we're focused on fixes there. Uh, we were testing a seal deterrent, uh, a new technology at the locks uh, this year. And uh, things seem to be going pretty well. The seals were bugging off when we put the, the deterrent in, so that's a good sign. Uh, we'll continue to be testing that at other places this year. Um, and then uh, as far as the locks itself go, um, we are focused on um, fish passage now, trying to get adult fish in particular, um, I think as a first step up through the locks and um, through uh, the warm uh, water of a lot of them start returning essentially adult salmon start returning in the summer so we need to um, provide safe passage for them so we're trying to find ways to either uh, cool uh, the canal or uh, find other uh, ways to facilitate passage and then uh, finally we have a project in the Duwamish uh, with uh, partner Vigor Industries uh, it's basically a working shoreline where they have they do um, a ship repair work there, but they're restoring a part of their shoreline and we're helping uh, with their restoration monitoring um, and also uh, talking about uh, what their, their challenges and, and uh, hopefully successes um, as we go through this. Great. Uh, thanks, Michael. Yeah, we actually, um, Long and the Kings has been working on quite a few different projects around um, King County and it's I live right down in Seattle so it's cool to see work being done to restore salmon in my own backyard um, and then Jim I wanted to hear a little bit more about from you about uh, the work that King County is doing to restore salmon habitat in urban environments um, I know you had talked about one project with a uh, non-native fish species do you want to touch a little bit more on that uh, sure happy to um, you know so King County's um, primary, um, I guess, uh, responsibility area for uh, habitat restoration is in unincorporated King County. Uh, however, we do work closely with a lot of the municipalities that are within the urban, uh, urban areas, uh, such as Seattle, uh, Bothell, uh, Redmond, uh, you know, all the all the surrounding cities are really working hard to do a lot of habitat improvements. Uh, within unincorporated King County, um, the, we do a lot with uh, floodplain uh, restoration. That's a that's a major um, uh, action uh, taken on behalf of King County. There's a there's a lot of levees and revetments. Uh, the, they have different owners and the county is working really hard with the flood control district to, to mitigate those impacts and restore uh, um, uh, floodplain access uh, in a lot of these areas. Uh, there's also a new major uh, um, program to improve fish passage um, in, in uh, King County. And uh, one of the main goals with that is uh, to to uh, restore about two thirds of the available habitat over the next 30 years or so. Um, and there, there's literally hundreds of sites um, that the county's gonna be working on. So it's, a, so it's a major, major effort. And as Jack mentioned, um, you know, kind of on the biological side, we're uh, King County and the other partners um, that are working on uh, uh, salmon recovery, uh, Kokanee and Chinook uh, sockeye uh, recovery throughout the basin. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, um, uh, changes in uh, fish assemblage 
And uh, we, I mentioned before a study we did last year in Lake Sammamish, but there's also some ongoing work in the Lake Washington Ship Canal uh, with uh, state uh, DFW and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and we're also working uh, with, with other partners uh, evaluating uh, opportunities uh, for predator mitigation in the Lake Washington uh, Basin. Uh, bass, especially smallmouth bass, are a major problem um, in, the, in the system and we think that there's bottlenecks where uh, predation is concentrated. Uh, there's also a lot of yellow perch, um, uh, non-native yellow perch, um, in, in both Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish. Um, in Lake Sammamish, I mentioned, uh, we think that, you know, over 50% of the fish are yellow perch in the lake. So it's, um, you know, the, the, the change in uh, the, the fauna in the lake um, is, has been pretty dramatic. Um, but uh, we're, we're looking at opportunities to uh, mitigate, mitigate that over, um, uh, you know, the coming years. That's really interesting. Uh, thanks for sharing, Jim. And uh, it looks like we've just about run out of time for the presentation. Um, I want to thank everyone for watching us and tuning in today um, and learning a little bit more about the work that's going on with Long Live the Kings and the King County and the cap captive broodstock program for Lake Sammamish Kokanee. Um, we also want to give a quick shout out to all the different partners that have been crucial in uh, salmon recovery and co specifically kokanee recovery in Lake Sammamish. Um, so it looks like we have about 20 minutes left for Q&A. Um, we have a couple questions in there, but make sure to click on the Q&A button and type anything that you may be curious about or a question that you want answered. Um, and if Michael and Jim are ready, it looks like we can get started. Give me one second while I look through the questions. Let's see. So we have a question here for probably we can start off with Jim answering it and Michael, you can add anything if you want to um, afterwards. This is a question relating to that uh, graph you had about kokanee abundance in the lake. And Byron says, looks like they cycle with a large run every four years like sockeye what happened in 1819 and was a threshold crossed. So do you have anything to, to add about that? Yeah, that's, that's a great uh, question, uh, Byron. And um, in Lake Sammamish, uh, what we've observed with native kokanee there is that uh, the predominant cycle time is around three years, um, where sockeye, uh, especially let's just uh, consider cedar sockeye uh, in the, the Lake Washington Basin. Uh, that cycle is around four years. But uh, Lake Sammamish Kokanee uh, um, generally return about every three years. Our monitoring suggests um, that they return uh, th three year, three year old fish are, um, you know, typically 70 to 75 percent of the returning adults. We get about 20 percent uh, or so two year old fish. And then uh, you know a handful, five, ten percent uh, that are that are four-year-old fish, and that's pretty variable year to year. But uh, you're right. Um, there were there were there were some years between uh, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, um, and then fifteen, sixteen, uh, where we had these these uh, these very strong returns, um, and then there was a major decline, um, and. Yeah, I think a threshold of sorts was crossed. Um, uh, as I mentioned, and this the, the bar chart that we originally showed doesn't really show this really well, but uh, in the summers of 14, 15, and 16, so when we had that really good return uh, in the winter of 15 and those fish that went out to the lake in the spring of 16, uh, the survival of those fish were very, very poor. Um, and those were some of the hottest years that we've experienced in the lake. And so the, the mortality of those younger year fish was just um, uh, very poor. But as far as a threshold, um, you know, when, when populations get down really low, like they are right now, it's, um, 
it's really, it's, it can be really challenging for them to bounce back. They really had to ha have to have good conditions. Um, and right now there's a lot of things that are uh, going against these fish. We have uh, predation and we have much warmer temperatures in the lake. Um, and there's, there's a whole suite of other uh, uh, smaller impacts uh, that are occurring. So we think that, um, yeah, there is a little bit of um, a threshold of sorts. We, we, we really hope that it's not a permanent threshold. And that's why we're, we're doing the captive broodstock to ensure that kind of this abundance bottleneck of sorts um, is, isn't long lasting. But there's also a threshold I, I would add real quick that um, we're starting to see a threshold in um, declining genetic diversity. And that's where the captive broodstock program that we're working with right now and uh, coupled with our cryobanking we're going to be able to really ramp up our year to year uh, diversity, um, you know, with few fish. And so, um, you know, we're kind of excited about that. And we think um, we can, we can, um, um, you know, make sure that this kind of uh, threshold of sorts um, isn't long lasting uh, or permanent. Thanks, Jim. That was a really detailed response. Um, we have another one coming from Brian Myers and he's asking what is most likely, what is the most likely stream into Lake Sammamish that could become probably the fourth most common spawning ground? Do you think that they will start spawning in Zacchaeus Creek? So have you seen any of any specific creeks that are starting to gain more traction in terms of spawning kokanee? You know, we do see um, about 20, on average, about 20% of our spawning occurs um, in, in numerous other streams around the lake. And it's, uh, it's, it's really pretty cool to see because uh, these streams are pretty small. But one of the other major streams that uh, we do get spawning in is Tibbetts Creek, uh, which is just to the west of Issaquah Creek um, in, the, in the state park and, and heads up the canyon on the west side of town there. Uh, we also get spawning in uh, West Fork, Issaquah Creek. Uh, Pine Lake Creek is an important creek. Uh, Zacchaeus Creek, uh, now that we've restored passage uh, to that stream and um, uh, have run the RSI to plant, to restore a population in there for two years, we're really hoping we're going to start getting fish back in there uh, in about a year and two months. Um, but also George Davis Creek, Idlewood Creek, Vassa Creek, uh, Schneider Creek. Um, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a pretty neat system. It's, uh, so uh, I would say Tibbets right now is probably the the stream that we see the next most uh, highest amount of uh, spawning in fourth highest. I would say to answer your question. That's interesting. Um, I actually grew up in Issaquah, so I know exactly where Tibbetts Creek is in most of these. It's pretty funny to hear, hear you mention that. Um, I have a question from Mike and Leslie Schroeder that might be more directed towards Michael. Um, they note that at Glenwood Springs, are the fish transferred to natural ponds to forage for themselves at any point before being spawned? And for those of you who don't know, much of the Chinook work that Long of the Kings does up there, uh, the fish are raised in natural ponds. But Michael, do you want to Okay, yeah, sure. Right. So we do, um, we do have some natural ponds up there uh, for the Chinook. They partially feed on um, uh, wild stuff, I guess, insects and whatnot while those Chinook are there, and then those Chinook are released into the wild. The benefit of doing that for fish that you release out of the wild is that they're starting to get a little bit more wildlike because they have to spend the rest of their life there. Um, for the kokanee, we're rearing them to adult age and then just spawning them and taking their kids, you know, so um, we're not looking to make them uh, super wild. There is, um, there's a potential if you keep repeating that same process that you will kind of make a fish more domesticated, but then we take their kids and we put them out in the wild. So we try to cut that off essentially um, at the point where you, you take the children away and you throw them in the, in the stream. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and they're going uh, straight back from Glenwood once the eggs have been spawned um, back to the Issaquah hatchery. Is that correct? Or the well, the adults. Um, I, I'm guessing. I mean, some kokanee are repeat spawners. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. 
Are they or are they not? Are they always? They're, this is where I'm they're, getting they're a one and done. Okay. So they are one and done. So Sakai, Kokani, I, was, I, I get confused with Steelhead. Steelhead are not one and done. Um, they can repeat spawn. Um, but those typically meaning that once they, the adults spawn, we, we kill them in the process of spawning them because they're going to die anyway. Um, and then their eggs are fertilized and the fertilized eggs are transferred. Okay. Um, and we have another question from Tom O'Dell, and he asked if there's been any significant mortality experienced either during the transfers or shortly after the two transfers um, to Glenwood. No, thankfully. Uh, we've, they've done, Jim's been part of the, the tactical crew, I guess, uh, transferring the fish, and they've done a great job uh, keeping a lot of oxygen and uh, cool water on the fish um, and keeping them steady as they get transferred, and they've been great. Yeah, we've been uh, really, really lucky with these uh, transfers. Uh, we, we've, we've tried to think it through, um, you know, and as Michael mentioned, uh, you know, we have um, a steady oxygen supply. Uh, we monitor that and we try and keep that right in between, you know, nine and 11 milligrams per liter. Uh, we also salt the water a little bit, which uh, calms the fish down. Um, and helps take some metabolic stress off of the fish. Uh, and we try and maximize the densities um, or minimize the densities nice. of, the, of the fish. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, it's, it's gone great. And uh, Tom, we haven't, uh, with, with either transfer, we haven't had any mortality, um, you know, immediately after transfer. And, uh, you know, knock, 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 um, you know, short, to answer your question about shortly thereafter, um, we did not see any mortality with the first cohort, and we haven't had any mortality with the second cohort. Um, so um, we, we think we're, we're doing something right uh, with this. Um, and the, these fish are just doing uh, in incredibly well. Yeah, our, our hatchery manager up there decided to pull my leg, and the, the night of the transfer, he, he texted me, and it said, all the fish died. And he let me sit on that for like a half hour until he said, just kidding. So, oh yeah, my God. yeah, they're fine. So kind of going off that, Phil Stalkup asks, uh, what are the measurements and at what frequency is the project being monitored? So like those fish that are up at Glenwood, um, what sort of monitoring are you doing with them daily, weekly, monthly? Jim, you want to jump in there? I, I know you've been working with Mike on it. Sure. Um, that, that's a great question. And um, when we started out with this, uh, we originally anticipated um, doing uh, some condition monitoring, uh, looking at the lengths and the weights of these fish uh, in general health um, uh, about once every six months or so. Um, but these fish have been doing um, so well with uh, in these tanks. And it really goes to show that, uh, you know, cool, clean water in a very low stress, uh, pretty dark environment um, is working very, very well for these fish. Um, and the reason, we, and so to kind of get your, your question, we've had to ramp up our monitoring to about once every three to four months because the fish are gaining weight faster than we anticipated. Uh, they're gaining weight faster than we ever anticipated. So their, their uh, energy conversion efficiency is just, it's really off the charts. And so we've had to take a really close look and reevaluate um, just how much we're feeding them because we have a target weight, you know, at two and a half years after transfer. And, um, you know, having those fish get, you know, five, 10% above a, uh, a target a year, year and a half, two years out can have a, a pretty big change on your total biomass uh, when you go to spawn them in two and a half years. And, our tanks are really limited. They're really capped at around 235 pounds. So yeah, we're, we're monitoring more than we thought we would, but you know, it's just part of the learning curve with this. Totally. Um, so kind of going off that in the long term, uh, Gary Smith asks, well, first says, congrats to everyone involved in the Kokanee Rain at Glenwood. And he then asks, what's the long-term plan there, specifically a commitment beyond the current fish in the two tanks? So. Have you gotten to that point yet where you've thought about what might happen after you spawn the first cohort of fish? Are you planning on bringing up more next year or either of you care to touch on this? 
I think we had planned for three years of fish as, as the pilot essentially. So you three cohorts, um, which is about six years of work and then uh, evaluate on that last group, probably a year out where we stand and, and uh, whether or not it makes sense to continue doing it uh, the way we're doing it or change things up or discontinue altogether if it's not needed. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, and then let's see. So shifting a little bit back towards the work that's being done at Lake Sammamish, Fred Kuntz asks, on the remote incubator, what are they stocked with? Wild eggs from adjacent water? And then he says, thanks. So Jim, do you want to touch on that? About maybe uh, how the remote incubators work? Sure. Uh, so the remote incubator um, is, uh, you can almost think of it as a little side stream. Um, we, we have an intake and it's all gravity fed. Um, and so we have an intake that pulls about um, 11 hundredths of a CFS uh, from the stream. Uh, we, have, we get a water right for that. It goes into a uh, sediment filtration system, uh, three different phases, um, and then it goes into the egg box. And those boxes are designed to hold about uh, 18,000 eggs each. Um, so, you know, that box probably didn't look very big, but, um, you know, kokanee eggs, um, they're not that big either. They're not as big as, you know, Chinook uh, eggs. So we can, uh, we can put a little bit more in there and get uh, good spacing and get uh, good water flow through the system. But uh, we are using uh, wild, um, well, they're really wild fish because it's an integrated hatch supplementation program. So that uh, any of the eggs that we're using um, are from wild fish. Um, so the way that that works is that we will spawn um, a, a series of wild fish um, at Issaquah Hatchery. Uh, we disinfect those eggs um, and then they're incubated um, until they eye up and they're picked and so on. Uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, shocked and picked. Um, and then we actually uh, thermally mark uh, the specific eggs that we're going to put back into the remote incubator. Um, and we do that so that we, you know, three years down the road, we can determine if that uh, conservation strategy is a success or not, because, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing all the time. And if it's not working, then we either need to figure out a different way to do it or uh, figure out a whole new strategy. Um, but basically they are wild eggs um, and we are using uh, adjacent stream water. So they do imprint on that. How many, uh, maybe if you know off the top of your head, how many remote incubators are around the Lake Stamish area? Are there mainly that just like one along, I think you said that was I Idlewood Creek maybe? We have, we have two, we have two uh, remote incubators uh, going right now. Um, well, they're not actually running water through them right now. Uh, we, we only actually operate them from December through May uh, or until all the fish, um, you know, hatch um, and rear in the gravels and then emerge and go into the stream. Uh, and that's about a, it's about a five month uh, period, um, give or take a little bit. Uh, but right now we 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 are um, stocking Idlewood Creek and Zach Hughes Creek, and uh, we're looking at uh, after we do that for three years, and we're on our third year uh, coming up here, then we'll shift to um, other streams such as uh, George Davis or Tibbetts, and keep moving around the lake to uh, to kind of build that population resilience with different uh, spawning populations around the lake. I see. Um, Looks like we might have time for one more question. Um, maybe this is kind of related to what you were talking about at the end of your presentation about the non-native predators. And Byron asks, how can the cochineer recovery effort avoid feeding bass? So maybe you could touch a little bit on um, <laughs> how, if there's been any ideas about how to either, how to combat this non-native predator problem in Lake Sammamish. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great question. Um, and, um, you know, I think most of you are familiar with Lake Sammamish, uh, but if you're not, uh, the lake is about, uh, you know, it's about eight miles long or so and about a mile wide. Um, but 
um, all those non-native fish um, that I was talking about earlier, the yellow perch, um, you know, smallmouth bass, we have largemouth bass in there. Um, uh, and we have rock bass. It just, it's just a whole suite of non-native fish in there now. There are potential predators at different life stages. But those fish all tend to occur um, with generally within about 100 feet of the shore. And so we theorize that um, a lot of the predation that is occurring um, is right when these fish are emerging from the stream that they respond in and moving out into the main uh, water column in the, in the middle of the lake. And so, uh, yeah, to avoid that, one of the things that we've been doing is uh, we, we are experimenting with a strategy uh, called unfed fry um, at Issaquah Hatchery. And um, these are specially uh, marked, thermally marked fish. And what we do is um, the hatchery staff at Issaquah will watch uh, these fish um, rear and uh, basically uh, mature and absorb their egg yolk. And uh, right when the fish um, at the hatchery get to the point where they would otherwise normally um, emerge from the gravels and go out to the lake uh, and begin their life in the lake and start feeding there. Um, but instead of putting them, running them through this kind of ring of fire gauntlet around the lake, we are taking those fish um, at night and transferring them to the middle of the lake. Um, and we've done that for two years now, and uh, we should be able to start seeing um, whether or not we have a positive response from that strategy um, in about a year and two months, year and three months during uh, the winter of 2021 uh, when those fish return. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting program. And I'll be curious to see how it uh, ends up turning out if you have any spawners returning. Um, but I just want to give a thank you to Jim and Michael for joining us today. Um, it is four o'clock, so we're out of time. Um, this presentation will be recorded and we'll post it online um, for anyone else who wants to watch it or share it with anyone, any of their friends. Um, Jim, Michael, do you have anything else to say before we log off? No, just thank you all for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, th thanks a ton and uh, thanks for the invite and uh, opportunity to share uh, what, we're, what we're doing. Yeah, Jim, I really appreciate you joining us today. All right, thanks all.